I'm Sherilyn Skolnicki, and this is Brilliant Balance, the show for working women who are ready to shine. Each week, I bring you ideas, inspiration, and insight on balance, business, and getting it all done gracefully. You ready? Let's be brilliant. This is episode 347 of the Brilliant Balance podcast. What's your leadership superpower? Today, we're going to take a trip into the world of leadership together in this episode. And I think it's important context to know that I sort of grew up as a leader within the walls of Procter & Gamble. I came into P&G as a brand new hire, fresh out of college. And in the interview process, you know, they ask a lot of questions about leadership experience and things you've done up until then. And like any dutiful interviewee, I told my stories of leadership. And in reality, I had them, right? I had things that I had done in high school clubs that I'd led or been captain of a team and things I had started when I was at college that, you know, technically I could have called myself a leader. But the reality is I didn't have very much experience as a leader when I was brand new to that organization. And yet within 24 months of arrival, right, being a brand new hire in Atlanta, I was promoted to leading my first team. And I had a team of really seasoned salespeople. So when I started my career, you may not know this, I started in sales and I was in Atlanta And this region that I was leading was the Southeast region for the particular division that I was in. And there were 14 people who worked there, all of whom probably had 20 years more experience than I did. I mean, at least 15, in some cases, 25. And on that entire team, guess how many women there were? One. (laughs) So 13 men, one woman on that team of very seasoned, experienced, capable salespeople that I got promoted to lead. So it was a bit of trial by fire. I've talked about this tangentially in the podcast over the years, and I learned so much about leadership in that first experience. There were more than one night of tears, that is for sure. This was an era where we were really trying to introduce technology to this remote sales organization. So Procter & Gamble is headquartered in Cincinnati, salespeople at the time all over the country um, and really around the world. And we were really starting to bring technology into the sales process. And I think that may have been one of the reasons that it made sense to have a younger leader in place. That was not the most well-received initiative probably in the history of sales, nor were some of the sales automation initiatives that I was a part of later. But I was the youngest person on the team by a lot and one of only two women in this entire organization. So I really had to learn a ton on my feet. And thankfully for me, P&G is what has often been referred to as an academy company, meaning that they grow leaders. Like It's just an organization that is particularly good at training leaders and equipping them and giving them lots of experiences. And while the MBA that I was working on was helpful and, you know, all of my undergrad experience or degree in business was helpful, it really was my years of hands-on experience there that gave me frameworks and opportunities to lead that I think I carry with me to this day. So recently, I was in a client call, like a group call, and one of my clients who is leading a team of relatively young leaders, people who, in many cases, this is their first leadership experience, was kind of pulling her hair out and asking for help around training. How do I train these people to lead? Because her the number one thing she was noticing, and this may be familiar to you if you're a leader as well, is that they kept like jumping in to do the thing instead of teaching people and coaching people on their team through how to do things. And, you know, if you've ever found yourself in that situation, which I have many times found myself in that situation, you really reduce your effectiveness pretty dramatically if you are trying to do every single thing yourself, right? The whole idea of leadership is to know how to get results through others. So we were talking with her about this idea of how do I train 
these people, you know? And of course, there are a thousand things that that you could do. There's a thousand trainings. There's a thousand books that they could read. There's so many resources out in the world on leadership. But immediately, like instinctively, what I thought of first when she asked this question was a model that I first learned when I was at P&G. And it's referred to as the five E's of leadership. Now, oddly, fun fact, when I first thought of this, I thought of it as the three E's. And that's what I said to her in the call. And when I did a little fact-checking expedition for this episode, it showed me why. Because the history of this model, which started back with A.G. Laffley when he was the CEO of the company, and Jack Welch when he was the CEO of GE, it started as a 3E model and evolved to 5Es. So the 3Es, when I was growing up in that company, like late 90s, this was the version. It was Envision, Energize, and Enable. And I think I could recite that in my sleep. You know, Envision, Energize, and Enable was what came out of my mouth when I was in this coaching call with my team. And then what I learned was Jack Welch, his three E's were energy, edge, and execution. And Jack and AG were collaborating at a consulting firm at one point, and they put their heads together. And ultimately, this three E model that each of them had had evolved into a five E model. And that's what I want to share with you today. Because I think that these five E's give us all an opportunity to identify what is our own personal leadership superpower. What I remember when I was going through this training was that it was, first of all, it was a really good training. And I learned when I was doing a little research, it was the highest rated course in PNG history. So PNG has a big library of training resources that you can go through, like in-person classes. And this was the highest rated course in PNG history on this 5E model. So these are broadly adaptable to any organization. I think I lean into them every day in my company. And when we were sharing this in the coaching call, it was clear that all the women in attendance were like, yeah, this is something that we could really quickly understand and also share with the people that we are leading. So I want to share it with you today, the five E's as they've evolved. The first one is still Envision. Okay, envision. And envisioning as a leader is really about what's next, right? Being able to describe what like winning looks like over a period of time off into the future. And in order to do that, in order to have a clear vision, you have to be creative, right? This is this is the piece of leadership that's like being able to be in touch with what's going on inside the organization and what's happening in the environment where that organization operates, like what's the the broader context competitively or technologically that we are, you know, economically, what's happening around us in order to really create a vision that's compelling for the future. And that vision, it done well, is one that kind of changes the rules, right? It enables that organization to win because it steers it toward open water right? White space where there's not such a crowd of competitors. And I think young leaders sometimes are challenged by this E in particular. They're not often given big responsibilities around envisioning. And if you think about the most senior leaders, this is often like a superpower, right? Really being able to see white space and move organizations toward it. It's deeply rooted in strategy and a lot of forethought. And so this ability to see something that hasn't been done before or to go someplace that the organization hasn't been before is really part and parcel of the envision idea. So as you're thinking about yourself as a leader and thinking what really is, what would make me a good leader? What would people say about me? That's the first one up for consideration is envision. The second E is engage. So to engage is to connect with other people. This is where people get brought into an idea, right? It's not enough to have an idea and sit in an ivory tower and try to execute it, right? It it requires kind of going off into the world, into the halls of the organization, into conversations across functions to really make connections with people who are going to have to buy into this idea. And also they're going to have to participate in converting the idea into a plan. So engaging with people is where, you know, courage really is required in Jack Welch's parlance, guts, which I love, but that's like, that's so Jack Welch, right? That language. 
And if, by the way, if you don't know who Jack Welch is as a leader, there's so, I mean, there are books that have been written about him as a leader at uh, GE back in the day. And he had a storied personality, I'll say. Like there's the mixed reviews on his leadership overall, but I think when he says that guts or edge were one of the most important things he looked for in leaders, it really, that makes a lot of sense if you know anything about Jack. So engaging, being able to kind of get out there and mix it up with people and get them involved in this idea to help make it better, to round out the edges of the vision, that is the second E. So I think those of us who really gravitate to people, who like people, who are willing to kind of mix it up and let ideas get pulled apart. There's maybe some conflict involved in this before they get better. That's what this engaging part is all about. Hi, it's Cheryl Ann. Thanks for listening. Did you know that the ideas I share on this show are things I also can help you implement? If you want me in your corner, helping you find more time for what fills you up, go to brilliant-balance.com forward slash schedule and sign up for a free exploratory call. Give yourself this time. You'll be so glad you did. So envision, engage. The third is energize. Now, energize is how I was taught this E. It has been evolved to the word empower. And I think it's it's just two sides of the same coin, right? I remember it being described to me as bringing passion to an idea, being able to get people excited about the work that was going to be done. Right. So, and maybe the reason that this word shifted is that we really want to go beyond just getting people excited. We really want to motivate them and we want to give the people who are working for us the belief and the tools that they can, in fact, do the work that's required. So, this energizing piece is like getting buy in to the vision. So, we have a big idea. And the engagement part is getting everybody's input. So the idea becomes, it has legs, right? It has the meat on the bones of the, just an idea. And then energizing is where we go get people fired up. And we want everybody to be excited about this vision so that that energy is contagious. And then they actually want to go take action within their own area of responsibility. Okay. And sometimes, particularly when the going gets tough, I think this energize E is one we really lean into, right? Particularly in difficult times, difficult economic times for a company, if sales are down, if the competitive environment is difficult, maybe there have been layoffs, like keeping people's spirits high and keeping them really focused on moving forward together can be particularly challenging. You need a certain leadership skill set to be able to do that. The fourth E is enable. Enable is really about creating the capability in others and the confidence in others to do their job. So when when I was thinking about the woman who asked this question in a coaching call, enabling was probably the part that she was the most hungry for resources in, right? How do I get these leaders to be enablers? Think about the way I mentioned that she framed the question. It was like they kept digging in and doing the work themselves and she needed them to teach, basically, to translate the knowledge to a, to their organization so that they could get more done. So enabling is where we stop picking everything up with our hands and we shift into coaching, mentoring, teaching, training. You know, our interactions with our team in one-on-ones or in group settings are more about enabling them to do the work. We find those teachable moments where we're able to train them as they're doing. So if you think about in your own organization, if this is something that's a challenge for you, the way it was in in the call I was describing, what is often difficult for young leaders to do is they think they're the most effective. They think that they're valuable by getting things done. And they really don't know yet how to translate their knowledge to other people so that other people can follow the same process. So some of this enabling work is like having the skill to break down how you have done something and describe it to someone else so that they can then repeat that process. And I got to be honest, a great training ground for this, like a great place to practice this is at home. If you have kids at home and you are thinking, oh, why am I doing everything myself? Why does nobody else do this? 
often what's happening at home is there this piece has been skipped over. And we think, oh, they don't know how to do it. It's just easier for me to do it myself. But if we replace the time we would spend doing a task with teaching the task, it is amazing how that pays dividends. I have a teenage son who is an incredible cook. He's just an incredible cook. And it's because earlier in his life, he showed an interest and we took the time, I took the time to show him how to do some things in the kitchen, you know, slowly, painfully, so that now with those years of practice, he is just just remarkably capable, right? I mean, continuously astonishes me with what he can do in the kitchen. Now, my other two children have been less interested in that. So the same enabling process didn't happen with them, right? But it's happened in other areas. And so thinking about the same thing can be true in a workplace. You may have someone who's really interested in learning how to do something. That's where you want to invest the time and energy. It doesn't have to be equally distributed across a team. And then the fifth E in this model is execute. And execute is really, you know, kind of where the rubber meets the road and the plan gets put into action. So leaders have to be able to execute themselves. They can't just sit at a desk and hope it all works out, right? There is usually some element that they have to be able to do independently. But you can be leading yourself, right? If you're a really strong individual contributor, then personal leadership looks like I'm really good at executing, right? As soon as we get teams, these other pieces, enabling, energizing, you know, become more important. And then the higher up we go, the more important engaging and envisioning becomes. So I do think there's a bit of a hierarchy to these five E's where if you if you think about them as highest to lowest level, and again, this is my commentary on it, is envision would probably sit at the highest, then engage, energize, enable, and execute. Okay, and then execute is something we need everyone to do, even if there's no one reporting to them. It's like personal leadership looks like being accountable to yourself, accountable to others, hitting deadlines, getting things off the to-do list, right, and behind you and kind of picking up new things. So as you reflect on these five E's, I think there's a couple of levels to think about. What is your superpower? Which one of those five do you think you're most naturally gifted with? right? What do you gravitate to without really having to be taught or trained? And how can you use that? How can you use that particular vector of leadership to your advantage? The second question I would think about is where do you need uh, growth? What's your growth edge, right? Which one of these five E's is a place where you personally could spend some effort and energy? Maybe you need to look for training yourself. Maybe you need to ask for mentorship or coaching yourself in one of these areas so that you can continue to round out your skill set as a leader. So you're going to have some area that's naturally your aptitude and some area that maybe you even avoid because you either don't like it or you don't think you're very good at it. And I think this is a, a good reminder to go get some support in areas that you don't feel like you're where you really shine, okay? I think the second thing you think about here is your teams. So if you are a senior leader and you have people reporting to you who have people reporting to them, right? If you're in a multi-level hierarchy, then this is a great model to think about equipping your direct reports with so that they can turn around and use it within their organizations, right? I think this is a, a just... It's a, it has broad shoulders. This model itself has broad shoulders that I think could be used at, at varying levels in your organization. And then I'm curious, as I was reflecting on these five, like, are there other superpowers that you think leaders need to have? What's missing from this model when you think about what has made a great leader maybe that you've worked for or observed or what do you think makes you a great leader? I'm curious if there is something that you are aware of that I haven't referenced in this model that you would add to it. And I'd love to hear from you if you have one. If something comes to mind and you're like, you know what you're missing, it's this. Like, where does this fit? Because I don't know that this is designed to be comprehensive. I don't know that this is every attribute we want a leader to have, but it's a good list of attributes, um, certainly to consider. So a great place to hit me up if you do have a comment and we're not already in touch is on Instagram. I'm at cskolnicki on Instagram. 
just drop a comment. We'll be posting about this podcast episode all week like we usually do in various ways. Um, So any of those posts will be a great place to drop a comment. You also could be emailing me directly. If you go to our website at brilliant-balance.com, there's a contact us form there that you can use. Or if you are a subscriber to the weekly, and if you're not, you should be. (laughs) If you're a subscriber to the weekly, you can just reply to any issue. And my team gets those emails and then can can share your comments with me. So a few different ways to reach out. And I really would love to hear your thoughts on what I've shared today. I think leadership is such an important but broad subject. And so maybe it's something that we'll continue to talk more about here on the show. That's all for today, my friends. Till next time, let's be brilliant. This is the podcastfactory.com.